Okay, praise the Lord. Let us pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank thee for thy faithfulness. We thank thee as thou hast said that thou wilt never leave us nor forsake us. For being thou with us, around about us as the mountains are run about Jerusalem. We thank thee for giving us this day our daily bread, as thou supply us all of our need, according to thy riches and glory by Christ Jesus our Lord. For thou art our shepherd, and we shall not want. And as man shall labor but alone, but every word is proceeded out of thy mouth, as newborn babes we desire then sincere milk of thy word, whereby may grow thereby, thanking thee for preserving thy pure words for us. Thy word, O Lord, which endureth forever, the word which by thy gospel is preached unto us, as heaven and earth shall pass away, but thy word shall be forever, thy word which thou hast magnified above all of thy name. Sanctify us with thy truth, for thy word is truth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Praise the Lord. Before we hear from the preach of God's word today, I would like to give another testimony. Let us turn to Bible's book of 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Beginning in verse 20, it is written, now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. Who is an ambassador for Christ? 2 Corinthians 5, verse 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. New creatures in Christ are ambassadors for Christ. Verse 20. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. Who are ambassadors for Christ? New creatures in Christ. And what are new creatures in Christ? They are those in whom old things are passed away, and behold, some things are become new. No. And behold, Things are slowly becoming new, slowly, step by step, growing. No. Behold, all things are become new. A new creature in Christ is the old things are passed away. And behold, all things are become new. And when that happens, a person is in Christ and becomes a new creature in Christ and the old things are passed away and behold, all things are become new. They are ambassadors for Christ. And because the old things are passed away and all things are become new as we are ambassadors for Christ, it draws souls to us as we shine as lights in this world and are as the salt of of the earth. Praise the Lord. This past Friday evening, as we went to preach the gospel to Pat Pong Road here in Bangkok, Thailand, we, or at least I, was shocked. What shocked us? And one of the first times I've ever experienced in 27 years of living here in Thailand, Pat Pong Road was closed. Now I've only known of it being closed a few other times for emergency reasons when they had uprisings and things like that. But this was a shock to me that on this past Friday night, as we went to the preach the gospel to Pat Pong Road, and why were we going to Pat Pong Road to preach the gospel on a Friday night? Because before I became a new creature in Christ, before the old things were passed away and all things became new, I used to go to Pat Pong Road on Friday nights to sin, to fornicate, to smoke drugs, to drink alcohol, to street fight, things that would have damned my soul to hell if I had died back then. But praise God, oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endureth forever. Psalm 136, verse 1, I did not die back then. Back in 1995, I was born again. I became a new creature in Christ. And now when we're here in Bangkok on a Friday night, we go to preach the gospel there on that same road that I used to sin on before, so much so, before I was a new creature in Christ. 
And then this past Friday night as we arrived there, Pat Pong Road was close. They still had the street market, but all the bars, all the signs are all closed. It was dark. It was turned off. And hardly anybody was on that road, though they saw the street market, but it was basically empty, except for the people working at the street vendors on that street market. You see, this month, October of 2017, is a month of mourning for Thailand. And because this month is a month of mourning for their former king has passed away last year, and they're going to cremate him at the end of this month, and they've made this month a month of mourning, Thailand is now in the dark. Everybody goes to sleep early. There's no parties or celebrations. There's even no advertisements on television. And even on the Thai television, from what I've heard, we don't have a television, but from what I've heard, they've made it black and white or dimmed down even the colors as it is a time for mourning. And we arrived at this past Friday night. Pat Pong Road was closed. But I had prayed that afternoon. I had spent that afternoon in the prayer closet following the apostles' example who gave themselves to continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And so because I prayed that afternoon, I desired to preach the gospel, but there was nobody there. Jesus Christ says to go into the world and preach the gospel too every creature. He didn't say just to preach the gospel when nobody's around. How many people I've witnessed on the YouTube, now there's this thing called YouTube and you witness a lot of people who try to preach the gospel and are complete failures, they preach to nobody. Jesus Christ did not say, go to the world and preach, and then if you're preaching, you're doing the will of God. He says to preach to every creature. You've got to have people you're preaching to when you preach the gospel. You don't just go out there somewhere where nobody's at and then preach to nobody. And so because there was nobody there, though I had a heart's desire to preach, there was nobody to preach to. So because of that, we decided we would have to leave that area. As we're walking off Selim Road, turn down a small back alleyway, a back street, knowing we're going to have to leave, not know where to go to. Bangkok was closed. The streets are closed. I spent that afternoon in prayer. We're going to preach the gospel. We did something. We had not done it in a long time. Let's eat a little snack outside. Now, you'll never die of hunger, but you'll die of poison. A lot of the foods that are made outside here, a lot of the restaurants, the street vendors, it's complete poison they're feeding you. That white rice is putting people in the grave. White rice is a killer. And white dough and white flour is killing people. It's what's giving people the heart problems. It's what's giving people the diabetes. It's what's putting people in the grave. And then on top of that, they use a lot of oil and use oil on top of that. But because we're out there, we weren't preaching the gospel, we saw a lady selling what's called roti. That's a Bangladeshi food that's here in Thailand on the streets. It's a real sweet made with white flour. I guess in English they may call that a pancake. It's a Bangladeshi pancake, so roti. And they put a ton of sugar on top and sweet milk. It's a killer and use margarine and not butter. All these things are bad for you. We very rarely eat this, if any time at all. But on this Friday night, we decided to eat one. A one bite, and that was enough for me for the rest of my life, hopefully. <laughs> that stuff will kill you again. You won't die of hunger. Fasting does you good. Going hungry will do you some good. But poison will kill you. And the majority of food that's being eaten today at fast food restaurants, at regular restaurants on the streets, it's poison. Even in the foods that could be good for you, they're adding poison to it called MSG. And they're using too much MSG in their foods. All these things are killing people. It's poisoning people. And when you get into health, you want to avoid all poison. And what do we be healthy for? Because you want to live a long life? No. We want to be healthy so we can serve the Lord at 100%. How many people try to serve the Lord, but their bodies are not at 100% and they fail miserably? you got to take care of your body. God has given us the body to take care of. 
and we take care of our bodies, that's a godly thing to do. This vessel God has given us to live in, God has also given us a responsibility to take care of it. And people don't take care of their bodies, they'll be judged by God for that. And there's many scriptures about this as well. So as we're sitting there eating that roti, I ate one bite, and that was enough for me. My eldest daughter overheard an Asian couple speaking together. In fact, the woman was yelling at the man. And she said to me, she doesn't know what language they're speaking, but she thought they were Vietnamese. Of course, I'm half Vietnamese. My late mother was Vietnamese, and I have a heart's desire, not only for all men to be saved, but especially those from my mother's homeland of Vietnam, especially since Vietnam has been closed the gospel for many decades due to communism. But praise God, here in Thailand, there's many Vietnamese coming over now because of ASEAN, the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, and they abuse their privileges of being part of ASEAN, come here and then work illegally. And there was this Vietnamese couple arguing on the streets. Now, my eldest daughter told me she saw an Asian couple. She knows they're not Thai, and she thinks they're Vietnamese. So I looked over at them and saw the lady yell at the man. I knew automatically that was Vietnamese, because Vietnamese women, they yell all the time. They're always angry and yelling about something. How do you know that? My mother used to yell at me all the time over nothing. She this is what they do. They just yell at you all the time. And seeing this couple, the woman yelled at the man, I knew exactly that was Vietnamese. Praise God. And our tracks we brought up, we always bring up Vietnamese tracks with us, as it is written in Philippians 4.19. But my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. God has supplied us a few years ago with 10,000 Vietnamese gospel tracks. And praise God, we had some with us. And I went to that couple and gave them a gospel track in the Vietnamese tongue. Not too long ago, Vietnamese would not even talk to me. They would have nothing to do with me because I mixed American Vietnamese. And because of their nationalism in Vietnam, and because the communists won that war, and they're very, at that time, were anti-American and anti-mix, what they call mixed breeds, mixed Amerasians, Vietnamese Americans. Back a few years ago, not too long ago, Amerasians were the ones in Vietnam who collected the trash. We're doing all the jobs nobody wanted to do. And the poor Amerasians, they couldn't even buy food at restaurants. They get chased out. Nobody wanted anything to do with an Amerasian. They used to call us a different word back when I was growing up, which I'm not going to use right now, in the Vietnamese tongue, which meant we're just dust. Dust, you get to sweep away. But now, in 2017, they call us Amerasians Kong Lai, which means mixed children. They accept us now as their children. They, they accept us as one of their own Vietnamese. And with that now, this mixed American Vietnamese can give them gospel tracts in their tongue and preach the gospel of them. And now today, in the day we're living in, a day that I never thought would happen, Vietnamese are accepting of us. And what a time for them to be accepting of us because I have the gospel to give to them. Praise the Lord. So I told that Vietnamese couple that I am a Kong Lai, a mixed child. They were happy about that. Gave them a gospel track. They wanted to know where my mother is from, so I let them know that she was from Dalat. But my family actually came from Hanoi and migrated to Dalat and then eventually ended up in Saigon during the war. And so as they heard this about me, saw this gospel track, got to give them our testimony. Praise God, my wife was able to show them pictures of us before we're born again and then after born again as a witness to Christ unto them. Praise the Lord. At the same time, a young Thai woman, a young lady, she came to buy some roti as well. But different was, she just put that roti in the bag and didn't even eat it. She was there buying roti because she was there interested in us. What caused her to be interested in us? She saw the way that we, especially my wife and daughters, were dressed. Because not only are we new creatures in Christ, not only have the old things passed away, all things have become new. Even the way that we dress. 
And because all things are become new, as we're new creatures in Christ, we dress now as ambassadors for Christ. Now, it's no real big deal when a man dresses up. That should be normal. Praise the Lord. Now, if a man doesn't dress up, something wrong with that person. It's not a hard thing for a man to dress up. And men should wear nice clothing. That's not hard to do. But the New Testament has many scriptures that tell a woman on how to dress. Such as in 1 Timothy, once again, chapter 2. The New Testament commends a godly woman on how to dress. 1 Timothy chapter 2, beginning in verse 9. In like manner also, that women adorn themselves in modest apparel, with shamefacedness and sobriety, not with broaded hair, or gold, or pearls, or costly array, but which becometh women pressing godless with good works. The New Testament commands a godly woman how to dress. And not just here in 1 Timothy chapter 2. We can look again, and I believe it's 1 Peter or 2 Peter. One of the epistles of the Apostle Peter. Uh, 1 Peter chapter 3. Beginning in verse 1 that is written. Likewise, ye wives... Be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, they also may without the word be won by the conversation of the wives, while they behold your chaste conversation coupled with fear, whose adorning, putting on a clothes, let it not be that outward adorn of plating the hair, and of wearing of gold or putting on apparel, but let it be the hid man the heart, and that which is not corrupt, or even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the Son of God of great price. Praise God. The Bible, the New Testament, commands a godly woman on how to dress. And why is that important? Matthew chapter 5, we abide in the doctrine of Christ. And Christ teaches us in his doctrine that we abide in. In Matthew chapter 5, beginning in verse 27, our Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior, our Lord, our Master, our King says, Ye have heard that it is said by them of old time, Thou shalt not commit adultery. But I am saying to you that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery, they're already in his heart. Now, if it's adultery for a man to lust after a woman, it is adultery if a woman causes a man to lust after them. And how would a woman cause a man to lust after them? By not wearing modest apparel. By clothes that show off their figures. And when that happens, a man may be able to lust after them, which causes that man to commit adultery, as Christ says. And the Bible tells us that no adulterer shall inherit the kingdom of God. Therefore, godly woman, abiding in the doctrine of Christ, will not dress in a way that shows off their figure. They're going to wear modest apparel. Apparel means covering and if you look into the Greek, it means a double covering on top of it. And that's why we wear cake dresses, my wife and my daughters do, or something else on top of it to cover the figure. Why would it be that way for? Because we abide in the doctrine of Christ. We do not want men to lust after you, my wife and my daughters, because that would be adultery for the man, and damn that man to hell if he does not repent. And then you'd be just as guilty as well. Therefore, the New Testament commands women who abide in the doctrine of Christ on how to dress. Not only that, in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, it is written. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 15. But if a woman have long hair, it is a glory to her. For her hair is given her for a covering. Now, we don't want to be gloried. We don't, men, we don't want men to glorify us. And as my wife has very long hair, and before we did not know these scriptures, and very ignorantly used to not wear head coverings and let her hair down, which goes all the way down to her knees, she would be glorified because of that. Men would be attracted to look at her with that long flowing hair. 
But praise God, years ago we met some Anabaptists of a chain my tail in. We asked about the head covering. He opened the scripture to us and showed us why you cover your head and especially your hair. And now though my wife has hair that goes all the way down to her knees, she covers it up as well as my daughter's with a head covering because we don't want anything to bring glory to us. All the glory goes to the Lord. Therefore, a godly woman not only wears modest apparel, she covers her head. And in particular, she covers her hair. A few years ago, a man tried to accuse me of my wife having short hair. And he took me to these scriptures of all places to falsely accuse me of letting my wife have short hair. I just had to laugh. If they saw how long my wife's hair was, they would probably go into shock or in a heart attack as her hair goes all the way down to her knees. So we cover our hair. We cover it as the Bible commands us in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. As it's written in verse 10, For this cause ought the woman to have power on her head because of the angels. What does that even mean? Well, if you believe the Bible... And Christ tells us, it shall be as in the days of Noah, the sons of God or angels fell and began having sex with the daughters of men. To protect us from something like that happening, we cover our heads because of the angels. A head covering becomes power. It protects you. And there's a lot of men who have devils in them, fallen angels living inside of them, that caused them to lust. They can't stop lusting. They call it an addiction. They get addicted to lusting. No, it's not an addiction. They have a spirit in them. And that spirit is a fallen angel. And fallen angels lust after the daughters of men, as is written in Genesis chapter 6. But now these angels have left their first state. They don't have a body, so they inhabit human bodies and use human bodies to commit fornication, and to commit sin. What will protect us from this? Power on the head. Head coverings protects a woman from lust. Especially those men who are so lustful, they have evil spirits, fallen angels living inside of them, driving them and controlling them to lust after women, to fornicate with women. They give themselves over to fornication because these fallen, these fallen angels, these evil spirits living inside of them. But in this land in which many are given over to lust and have evil spirits in them, you can be protected as a woman with power on the head, head coverings. And as we've read in some books, and as you've experienced yourself, there is a difference when you go in public with an uncovered head and a covered head. And that was so encouraging. My book we just read last year about, about a Cambodian woman living in America got converted to head coverings. And when she started wearing a head covering, nobody touched her. Nobody bothered her anymore. They're in America. They're so full of lust. Praise God. That's the testimony and the power of head coverings. So this woman on Friday night, this young lady, she saw the way my wife, my daughters were dressed. And she wanted to know who we were. We let her know that we're Christians. Now, though she is Thai, she knew there was Catholics, there was Protestants. Which one are you? Well, we're neither. We call ourselves Christians. No, no. There's Catholics and there's Protestants. Which one are you? No, we're neither Catholics or Protestants. Finally, seeing that she was not ignorant, she knew of some things, we explained to her that we were what they call Anabaptists. Now we call ourselves Christians, as it is written in Acts. Acts chapter 11, verse 26. And when he had found him, he brought him unto Antioch, and it came to pass in a whole year. They assembled themselves with the church, and taught much people, and the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. We call ourselves Christians. But those who are of the Catholics and the Protestants, they called us, since the 16th century on, Anabaptists. And so I let her know that we would be called Anabaptists by the Catholics and the Protestants. Her eyes lit up. She said, well, then you're pacifists. No, we're not pacifists. 
Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. Verse 38. It is written. The Lord Jesus Christ says, You have heard that it has been said, An eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I, the Lord Jesus Christ, send you that you resist not evil. But whosoever shall smite thee on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. And I explained to her that we're not pacifists. We, whom they call Anabaptists, are non-resistant. And I explained to her the difference between non-resistance and pacifism. She was very interested in this. That means she had studied. That means she had read about this. And I explained to her that we're non-resistant because we abide in the teachings of Jesus. We don't just believe in Jesus Christ. We obey his words, his teachings. She said, wow, I'm really interested in this. Do you do what he says? I said, yes. Nobody ever taught like Jesus. And there's no other teachings of the world like the teachings of Jesus Christ. And we obey his teachings, we that believe in Jesus Christ, and we follow Jesus Christ by obeying his words. It sets us apart as different from those in the world as we walk in a different way than the world does. And she said she was very interested in this. Praise the Lord. So my testimony is, because of the way we dress because we're new creatures in Christ, it draws souls to us. My testimony is this, though I was not able to openly preach the gospel this past Friday night, as Pat Paul Rowe was closed, we still could have been a witness in the Christ, because God still answers our prayers, as I spent that day in prayer, give myself contempt to pray in the ministry of the word, and souls are drawn to us, because we're new creatures in Christ, and we dress and act as ambassadors for Christ. And because of this, even this Thai woman who may not have even been a Christian, she knows some things. People are not ignorant. They know things. She's done some studying. She even knew that Anabaptists would be called pacifists, though that's a wrong thing. We're actually non-resistant. But she even knew that much. Praise God. People know things. And when we live outside of this world system, following the ways of the Lord, it draws people to us. They're professing Christians today that think they must be worldly to reach the world. They think they must dress like the world, act like the world, be like the world, and they'll win the world that way. No, it does not do that. We have learned from experience that if you obey the ways of the Lord, follow His ways, those in the world are drawn to us. And we're witnesses unto Christ because of it as we are ambassadors for Christ, we that are new creatures in Christ, in which old things are passed away, and behold, all things are become new. Praise the Lord. Let us turn again our Bibles to the book of Acts, chapter 2. Once again, looking at this first apostolic sermon found in the book of Acts, preached by the Apostle Peter on the day of Pentecost, and verse 22, the Apostle Peter preaches... Ye men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonder signs, which God did by him in the midst of you, as ye yourselves also know. Who is the Apostle Peter preaching to? Once again, we can find that in Acts chapter 2, beginning in verse Nine, there in Jerusalem, on the day of Pentecost, 50 days after the resurrection of Jesus Christ, 10 days after Christ ascended back to the right hand of God, because after Christ's resurrection, he spent 40 days on this earth with his disciples, and then ascended back to the right hand of God, for when she shall come again, and a day and hour that no man knows said the Father in heaven, Ten days later, on the day of Pentecost, as the apostles and the disciples of Jesus Christ were filled with the Holy Ghost, began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance, it drew souls to them. And where were these souls from? Acts 2 verse 9, Parthians and Medes and Elamites 
and the dwellers of Mesopotamia, and in Judea, and Cappadocia, and Pontus, and Asia, Phrygia, and Pamphylia, and Egypt, and the parts of Libya about Cyrene, and strangers of Rome, Jews and proselytes, Cretes and Arabians. Look at all the people the apostle was preaching to. We don't know how many there were, but it numbered into the thousands. How do we know it numbered into the thousands? Because in Acts chapter 2, verse 41, after the apostle preached that sermon, it is written, Then they that gladly received this word were baptized, and the same day there added unto them about 3,000 souls. So we know that there are over 3,000 souls listening to the Apostle Peter at this time. We know, as Christ says, there be few that find it. The majority did not get baptized. So this 3,000 souls who are baptized and added to the church, they were the minority in this group. So there were thousands, if not tens of thousands, hearing the Apostle Peter preach. And these tens of thousands who are hearing the Apostle Peter preach this apostolic sermon once again were Parthians, Acts 2 verse 9, and Medes, and Elamites, and the dwellers of Mesopotamia, and in Judea, and Cappadocia, and Pontus, and Asia, Phrygia, and Pamphylia, in Egypt, and the parts of Libya about Cyrene, and strangers of Rome, Jews, and proselytes, Cretes, and Arabians. There in Jerusalem, the Apostle Peter was not just preaching to local Jerusalem Jews. There in Jerusalem, the Apostle Peter is preaching to Jews and many proselytes who came from around the world gathered at Jerusalem on that day of Pentecost. He was preaching to souls from all over the world. Thousands of them, if not tens of thousands of them. And what did the Apostle Peter preach? Acts of Deuteronomy 22. As ye yourselves also know. The Apostle Peter boldly preached to them these thousands, if not tens of thousands of souls from all over the world, Jews and proselytes. Proselytes are non-Jews who converted into Judaism. Jews and proselytes from around the world gathered in Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost. The Apostle Bodhi says to them, Ye yourselves also know. What do they know? That Jesus of Nazareth was a man approved of God. How was he approved of God? They knew he was approved of God by miracles and wonders and signs. And they knew these miracles and wonders and signs God did by Jesus of Nazareth in the midst of them. The apostle says they knew this. They knew that Jesus of Nazareth did miracles, wonders, and signs. They knew that God did these miracles, wonders, and signs by Jesus of Nazareth. They knew this already. They knew that Jesus did miracles. They knew that those miracles are done by God doing them by Jesus in the midst of them publicly and openly. They knew this already. However, Knowing this did not save them. The apostle says they knew this already. They did not interrupt them and say, what are you talking about? We have no idea what you're saying. They knew this already. Because when God did these miracles, wonders, and signs by Jesus of Nazareth, he did it openly and word went around all over Jewry. Jewry means Jews are scattered around the world. When they would go to those feasts for three and a half years that Christ did his earthly ministries and three times in a year, in three and a half years that they came to Jerusalem, Christ openly taught, Christ openly did his miracles, Christ openly showed them who he was. For three and a half years, Jews from around the world would go three times in a year to Jerusalem as was commanded them in the Old Testament to appear three times here in Jerusalem at the temple and they would go there and hear Jesus, see Jesus, hear his miracles and then take that back to where they came from and word went around. God did not do these things in secret. The world at this time, especially amongst the Jews and proselytes, those who are non-Jews but converted to Judaism, 
They heard about Jesus. They knew about Jesus. Word went around and around the world. Because when Jews appeared three times in a year and Jerusalem for three different feasts are commanded to appear in Jerusalem and saw Jesus and heard Jesus, they went back to where they came from and told people about what they thought was a prophet in Jerusalem. About what they thought this could be the Messiah. This could be the Christ. He claims to be the Son of God, one with the Father. Word went around. As we read the Gospels on certain feast days, such as the Feast of Tabernacles, on the eighth day of the feast, Jesus showed up in the, in the temple preaching, and the people had gone there looking for him, talking amongst themselves. What do you expect? What do, you, do you think Christ will come? Do you think Jesus will be here? They went there looking for Jesus. They knew all about him. They knew about God doing miracle signs and wonders by Jesus Christ. So much so that the wicked king Herod, when Christ was presented before Herod, before he was crucified, Herod was expecting to see some kind of miracle done by him. He had heard so much about Jesus that when they brought him before Herod, he wanted to see a miracle. And then Herod helped for him to be crucified. They knew about him. They knew what God was doing by him. They knew about his miracles and wonders and signs. They knew that Jesus of Nazareth was a man approved of God, and no man could withstand that. They knew God was on his side. They knew God was doing miracles by him. They couldn't come against that. They knew this already, but it did them no good. I've met many missionaries here in Thailand from around the world, especially South Korea the Philippines, and especially my home country, I mean the United States of America. And many of these missionaries will have what they call a mission statement. That is a statement of their mission here to Thailand, and they must have a mission statement to raise up support. So how do you know that I have no support? I have no mission statement. <laughs> if you ask me what my mission statement is, I'll just look at you funny. I don't have a mission statement. But these missionaries, in order to have support, they must have a mission statement. And the supporters will ask them, what is your mission statement? And for many of them, these missionaries that meet here in Thailand from around the world, their mission statement will always include to make him known. To make Christ known. And for many missionaries, that is their mission. They want to make Jesus known. They want to tell people about Jesus. They want to make him known. And they will go to schools. And here in Thailand, the public schools are open to the gospel. You can go to public schools in Thailand and preach the gospel. Years ago, back in the year 2006 or 2007, I went with a group of young men to Sankabari, that's in Kanchanaburi, Thailand, on the border of the Thai-Burmese border. I went there to preach the gospel, and one young man who joined us was going to do chalk drawings. He had this tiso, is what we call it, right? Tiso, where you draw on. Is that what that wooden thing is called? Whatever that thing is called, you draw on. He had that, a board, and he had all this chalk, and he'd draw these pictures, and he'd preach the gospel. People would come look at the picture, and he'd draw some kind of gospel picture that correlates with what you're preaching. And so he went outside the school, right before the school was closing, a real big public school, and San Clavery, I think it was their main school, full of students, and he's setting all that stuff up, and the principal came out. Oh no, we're busted, I thought. He caught us. We're outside the school grounds. The principal walks up. I'm expecting him to yell at us, tell us to move on. He says, what are you guys doing? So I told him the truth. We are to preach the gospel. He's going to draw a picture. I'm going to preach the gospel. Come inside and do it and invited us inside the school grounds, and we got everything set up. When the school finished, he used a megaphone, called all the students, and there must have been hundreds, if not thousands, to us, and I got to preach the gospel, give out all these tracts, as the other young men were giving out tracts, and they couldn't get those tracts out fast enough to this whole school could hear the gospel. You see, the schools are open, and missionaries from around the world will travel all over Thailand and go to schools, and schools will bring them right on in to preach the gospel, to make Christ known. They come in there with their movies, the Jesus movie. They come in there with booklets. They come with all kinds of things to make Christ known is their mission statement. However, 
That's not what saves people to make Christ known. That's not what gets them saved. Telling people about the history of Jesus. And I've seen so-called street preachers here in Thailand start preaching and they're telling the history. The history of Noah, of Genesis, of God creating heaven and earth, Israel. And they go through the whole history. Jesus being born of a virgin. They go through the history. Nobody gets saved by that. That doesn't get people saved. They know this already. They know about Jesus already. Just like these Jews in Jerusalem, they knew about Jesus already. They knew as a man approved of God among them by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did by him in the midst of them. They knew this already. That did not get them saved. Head knowledge will not save you. Knowing the right things will not save you. And how many Christian denomination, how many churches believe that the day of judgment will be a theologic, theological test. Do you know the right theology? Do you know the right doctrines? And they think if you can answer the right questions with the right answers, they'll get you to heaven. And that's what they're teaching. Head knowledge Christianity. A Christian that acknowledges head knowledge about Jesus. And they think if you can say the right answers to the right questions, that that will get you into heaven. How many hypocrites we meet? who think they're going to go to heaven though they're living in sin, all because they know the right answers. I know I know about Jesus already. Right. I know the gospel. I know this. Why they're drinking alcohol, why they're smoking drugs, why they're living in sin and lust, and they think because they know about Jesus, they know the gospel, they know the Bible already, that that will get them to heaven. I know this already. You don't have to tell me, preacher. I already know this. They think that head knowledge will get them into heaven. The early church dealt with this. And what did the early church call those? Those professing Christians who are hypocrites, who are on the way to hell, committing sins, but thinking they're going to go to heaven and have the right head knowledge. What did the early church call them? Gnostics. And what does Gnostic mean? It means somebody who bases their religion on knowledge. Gnostic, Gnosis means to know. Gnostics were those who based their whole religion on head knowledge. As Jesus Christ says of the Gnostic group in Revelation chapter 2 once again, this was a group of professing Christians. They were following a deacon who had had the apostles' hands laid upon him. Today we'd call that an ordained minister. This ordained minister from the apostles whom the apostles laid their hands on, named Nicholas, he started a sect. And that sect was called the Nicolaitans. And what did Jesus say about those Nicolaitans? Revelation chapter 2, verse 6. But this thou hast, that thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. They did deeds that Christ hated. In this church, it was the church in Ephesus, Christ said they had this one good thing about them. They hated those deeds. The deeds of the Nicolaitans. They had the right head knowledge. In fact, their fallen Nicholas, a deacon from the early church, a man in whom the apostles had laid their hands upon, an ordained minister, we call that, a reverend, a man who had been ordained by the apostles, an ordained deacon. That's what they'll call him today. And Nicholas, this man who had been ordained by the apostles, he taught a doctrine that caused those who followed his teachings to commit deeds that Christ hates. Revelation chapter 2, verse 15. Christ in speaking to the church in Smyrna. No, Pergamos. Sorry about that. Christ in speaking to the church in Pergamos says, in verse 15, So hast thou also then the whole the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. He hated their doctrine. Because their doctrine produced deeds that Christ hates. And those doctrine producing deeds that Christ hates caused Christ to be against them. And the early church writers called the Nicolaitans one of the, what they called, Gnostics. And they explained that Gnostics were those who had head knowledge Christianity, but it did not manifest in their life. They looked like the world. They acted like the world. They sinned just like the world. What made them different than the world was they had head knowledge. 
head knowledge Christian. They knew all about Jesus. They knew the Bible. They knew the gospel. They knew it all. And they base their religion on knowing the right things. But their deeds were not of God. They would do things that Christ hates. Things that Christ spoke against, such as lust, which Christ calls adultery, divorce and remarriage, which Christ calls adultery, such as covetousness, which the Bible calls idolatry, such as hate, which the Bible calls murder. They did things that Christ spoke against, therefore he hates those deeds. They were workers of iniquity. They knew about Jesus. They knew all about Jesus, but it did not get them saved. In Acts chapter 2, verse 22, the apostle Peter preaches this first apostolic sermon in the book of Acts to Jews and proselytes. Those are non-Jews who are converted to Judaism. Jews and proselytes from around the world gathered in Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost, he preaches to them of Jesus of Nazareth, verse 22, a man approved to God among you by miracles and wonder signs, which God did by him in the midst of you, as ye yourselves also know. They knew about this, and it did them no good. If Peter had preached, does anybody here know about Jesus? They would raise their hands. Does anybody believe that it was approved of God? They would have raised their hands. How many of you know that Jesus did miracles? They would raise their hands, yes. Well, you guys must be Christians then. How many want to pray this prayer after me? Well, why not? And they could do that easily. And then he could say, you're all saved. Wow, tens of thousands got saved. That's not what the apostle did. That's what they would do today in today's Christianity. They base it like on the Gnostics. Head knowledge. Do you know the right things? How many do you know Jesus? Does anybody here know Jesus? People raise their hands. That's not what gets you saved. That's not what the apostle preached. When he preached to these Jews and proselytes, these converts to Judaism, of Jesus of Nazareth, he preached they knew this already. As ye yourselves also know that Jesus of Nazareth was a man approved of God among them by miracles and wonder signs which God did in the midst of them. They knew this already. What would get them saved? Acts chapter 2, verse 37. After preaching this apostolic sermon to Jews and proselytes from around the world, gathered on the day of Pentecost in Jerusalem, after preaching to them that they knew this already, they, verse 37, now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? Verse 38, then Peter said unto them, Do, no, 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 it's not works, no, 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 do, you don't have to do anything. Gnosticism, Jesus did it all, just acknowledge Jesus did it for you in your place, just say, yes, I agree with that, and now you're a Christian. No, the apostle Peter wasn't preaching Gnosticism. The apostle Peter was not a Gnostic. What must we do? Then said Peter unto them, repent. You may know all about Jesus. You may know that God did miracles by Jesus. You may know that God, Jesus, even came from God and is one with the Father. But that will not get you to heaven. What must you do? Repent. The apostle Peter preaches. Except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. What must you do? You must repent. A gospel without repentance will damn your souls to hell. Preaching of Jesus without repentance damns souls to hell. What must people do to be saved? They must first repent. And if somebody is preaching a gospel without repentance and preaching nothing but head knowledge, they're doing what the early church called deceivers, the Gnostics did. They're doing what Jesus says is a doctrine he hates and deeds that he hates. They're doing something that will damn souls to hell. No, you must repent. Christ did not come into the world to call the righteous but sinners to repentance. Christ called sinners to to repent. The Bible says, For thou shalt call the name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. 
He saves no one in sin. He saves you from sin. And if you want to get saved by Jesus Christ, you must first repent. You must repent. And it's something you do. Because they asked the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? This is something you must do. To get to heaven, there are things you must do. You don't just get to heaven by acknowledging the right things. You don't just get to heaven by believing the right doctrines. There are things you must do. And what must you do? Repent. And he doesn't stop there. Then Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Not only the Apostle Peter preached repentance, he preached you had to do something. You had to be baptized. For Jesus Christ says, what do you for you here? In Mark 16, 16, he clearly says, in Mark 16, 16, He that believeth shall be saved. No, he does not say that now, does he? He that believeth and does nothing else shall be saved. He does not say that. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. Baptism is only for believers. It is not for infants. If somebody got baptized as an infant, it did them no good. And if somebody's basing their faith on the fact that they got baptized as an infant, it will damn them to hell. That's why the Catholics and the Protestants call us Christians Anabaptists, rebaptizers. We believe if you're baptized as a babe, you need to get rebaptized as an adult. I was baptized when I was 12 years old. I was not yet a believer. I was baptized at 12 years old, not knowing anything about Jesus, not knowing the gospel, not believing, not repenting, nothing, and they baptized me. That did me no good. When I was born again back in 1995, shortly thereafter, in 1996, I was re-baptized. Baptized based on my faith. We believe, as Christ teaches us from his word, in believers' baptism. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. Why? Does the waters of baptism wash away your sins? Back in 2010, I believe it was, I was invited to Chiang Mai, Thailand to preach at a youth camp in the mountains of Chiang Mai, Thailand. And there's all these surrounding churches. It was a big youth camp at that time. And I was just one of the many guest pre preachers at this youth camp. And after the youth camp was finished, the last day, they had baptism, and they had a, a local reverend baptize the young people. And as he was baptizing the young people in this, this uh, concrete container of water, a baptismal pool that was there for baptism, as he baptized everybody, he finished, a local Thai man told this reverend, who was a Karen tribal from the Karen tribe, he said, you can take that water now and use it to water your plants. And that Karen tribal pastor, that reverend, said, oh, no, you can't do that. It would kill the plants. I overheard this said it would kill the plants. How is that going to happen? He said, oh, the sin has been washed, and it's all in this water. And this water is so full of sin and death. If you use this water to put on plants, it would kill the plants. I said, really? That water would kill plants? Yeah, oh, it's full of sin. All the sin has been washed off. I said, well, what if I took a cup of water? Cut glass, and I put it in that baptism and drink the water. What happened? Oh, you would die. All the sin and death would go in. It would kill you. It would kill me. Yeah, it would kill. That's full of sin. You see, that so-called reverend, he believed what's called in baptismal regeneration. He believed that the waters of baptism washed away your sins, and baptism saves you. That is, by baptism, you're born again. He took Scripture to context. Where Christ says, he that's born of the water, he must be born of water and the Spirit. He took that to mean as the waters of baptism. That's not what Christ was saying. He was talking about the first birth, your fleshly birth, which you're born of water, and then your second birth into the kingdom of God must be by the Spirit. But this man took that water as the waters of baptism. He believed in baptism or regeneration. He believed that the waters of baptism washed away your sins. So I told him, well, if I took a glass and drink this water, it kill me. What well, if my hand is? He grabbed my arm. Don't do that. No, don't do that. Oh, you mean, what would happen? Oh, you'd have sin all over you. Really? What about you? You're climbing. I gotta go take a shower. So then I said to him, so you're telling me that soap will clean you of sin. 
not this water. He thought about that for a minute. He thought, he just told me to go take a shower now and because this water is full of sin. And he realized, he just said that, soap washes away sin. At that, he walked away from me, never talked to me again, and never invited me to preach at the church again. That was back in 2010, seven years ago. He believed in a false doctrine of baptismal regeneration. What does baptism do? First Peter, in the book of, maybe a second Peter. No, first Peter. Sorry about that. First Peter chapter 3, verse 21. We'll begin in verse 20. Which sometime are disobedient, speaking of spirits in the prison, when once the long suffering God waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was preparing, wherein few that is eight souls were saved by water. If you stop right there, you can see, see, water saves you, baptism water can save you. Verse 21, the like figure. Where do even baptism also doth also now save us, not the bit of way that filled the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Baptism based on faith gives you a good conscience toward God. That's what baptism does for you. This figure, this light figure, which we call baptism, will give to you a, the answer of a good conscience toward God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's why we believe in believers' baptism. Infants cannot have a good conscience toward God by baptism because an infant's conscience has not even been developed yet. Therefore, we don't believe in baptizing infants or even young children. We believe when a person comes to that age where they can make the choice themselves, not be enforced, but to do it themselves, to make a free choice to believe in Jesus Christ, to repent and believe that then they're to be baptized based on their faith to give them what? The answer of a good conscience toward God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Therefore, we believe in believers' baptism. And Acts chapter 2, after the apostle Peter preached of Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles, wonders, signs as God did by him in the midst of you, as ye yourselves also know, when he preached Jesus to these Jews and proselytes who had gathered in Jerusalem, they didn't come because from around the world, they knew about Jesus already. They knew he was approved of God. They knew that God did miracles, one signs by Jesus of Nazareth. They knew this already. They asked them in verse 37, What shall we do? And in verse 38, Then Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ. Just knowing about Jesus will not get you to heaven. Just knowing the gospel will not get you to heaven. Knowing the right doctrines will not get you to heaven. Knowing the right answers to the right questions will not get you to heaven. Theology, right theology, will not get you to heaven. What gets you to heaven is what you do with what you know. If you know about Jesus, that it cause you to repent. If you know about the gospel, that it cause you to repent. That it cause you to do something. And did that repentance lead you to belief with so much faith in Jesus Christ that you went and got baptized because of it? Does your faith do something to your life? Can your faith be seen by your actions, by your works? Because faith without works is dead. If not, the knowledge of Jesus Christ will do you no good. The knowledge of the gospel will do you no good. So much so, the apostle Peter says it on this like, on this, on this manner, in the book of Second Peter, verse twenty-one. Second Peter chapter two, verse twenty-one. Sorry about that. 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 20. 
For if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled therein and overcome, the latter in is worth with them than the beginning. Christian hypocrites can be the most vile sinners, much worse sinners than even the world. The world, as evil as the world is, they still have a standard. And yet you'll find that hypocrites are worse than the world. For instance, the world, the evil, wicked world, looks down upon pedophilia, men having sex with children. Yet you will find many pedophiles in the church who call themselves Christians, professing Christianity even in the ministry, lusting after little children, and even committing sexual sins with little children. How can they be so wicked that the world even judges the church so full of these wicked men? Because the apostle writes, Under this was your use. For after they escape the pollution of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled, they are not overcome. The latter end is worse for them than the beginning. As evil as they were before they came to the knowledge of Jesus Christ, as evil as they were before Christ, if they go back again, they become worse than the beginning. In verse 21, For it had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than after they have known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered unto them. But as happened unto them according to the true proverb, the dog is turned to his own vomit again, and the so that was washed or wallowing in the mire. That is some scary words for those who base their Christianity on head knowledge and not on action, not on deeds, and not on works. You show me your faith without your works, the Apostle James says. I will show you my faith by my works. Head knowledge Christianity will not get you to heaven. Knowing the right things will not get you to heaven. Knowing the right doctrines will not get you to heaven. It all depends on what you do with Jesus Christ. What you did with the gospel. What you did with the doctrine of Christ. Therefore, in the apostle would have preached these men from all over the world who knew of Jesus of Nazareth. Who knew that God did miracles and wonder signs by him. Who knew there's a man approved of God. He preached to them that they needed to repent and that they needed to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And if it was true of those Jews back then, it's true of professing Christians today who base their salvation on head knowledge. You must repent. As Jesus Christ says, repent ye and believe the gospel. For Christ says, except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. Let us pray together. Heavenly Father, as thou hast magnified the word above all of thy name, we thank thee for thy word which endureth forever. The word which by thy gospel is preached unto us. Sanctify us thy truth, for thy word is truth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Praise the Lord.